Lonely and empty are the two words that come nearest to describing my condition, my life. I'm far from being tired of life. It's rather that I long for a chance to live. I have never, since childhood, been fascinated by anything but the unattainable. The rainbow continually recedes. Stephenson was not much of a leader at all. He was a lone wolf as an explorer. They thought he was a poseur. I don't know why, because he was a totally likable person. I don't think he had a Napoleonic complex at all. Probably a Stephensonian complex. <laughs> he is absolutely and clearly one of the greatest discoverers of all time. Wilhelmir Stephenson was one of the most controversial explorers of the early 20th century. Famous the world over for his Arctic exploits, many considered him a fraud. The scientific establishment drummed him out of Canada, accused him of slander and being responsible for the death of 11 men on the ice. His accomplishments were labeled publicity stunts. His bravery scorned as the ultimate ego trip. Who was the real Wilhelmir Stephenson? He is born in 1879 on a farm outside Gimli, Manitoba, the child of Icelandic immigrants fleeing their homeland in the 1870s for the promise of the new world. They had a terrible life. Uh, it was extraordinarily difficult, and there were great tragedies. And imagine that they had left Iceland. They took ships across the Atlantic, then they had to travel inland uh, for days and weeks. And after all of that, the children started to die, uh, the women started to die. And I think it is impossible for us really to understand uh, the tragedies that these people had to suffer. The land was poor crops failed and left many a pioneer family to starve. In that tragedy, I lost a brother and a sister. The rest of us, along with many of our neighbors, saved ourselves by the pioneer method of getting up and going elsewhere. The Stephenson family leaves Canada, traveling across the U.S. border into what was then Dakota Territory. Stephenson grows up introspective, dependent on his mother. I can see the Bible open before me on a table and hear myself reading aloud while my mother did the household chores, half listening, correcting me occasionally, or stepping over to have a look at a troublesome word. I read the whole Old Testament to her before I was six. He longs to relive the ancient sagas of the Norse explorers, continents lost in the ice, journeys to the edge of the world. Arctic dreams fuel the imagination of a lonely boy. In an Eskimo house, I've never heard an unpleasant word between a man and his wife, never seen a child punished, nor an old person treated inconsiderately. They live under conditions of which we merely dream. At age 13, Stephenson's father dies, leaving a wife and four children defend for themselves. The fact that he and his brothers and sisters had to struggle for existence, it was either a matter of giving up or, or surviving, and, and if you survived, you were pretty strong. The only way out is education. In September 1898, Stephenson boards a train for the first time, bound for the University of North Dakota. He excels as a student, but just before graduating, is expelled for questioning authority. The son of immigrants, he's compelled to prove himself. He carried with him what we could call, in a good sense, the, the arrogance of the Icelanders, that the farmer and the fisherman doesn't hesitate to speak openly to the king. Stephenson takes his Icelandic arrogance to the University of Iowa, where he obtains a bachelor's degree in 
only one year. Redeemed, he's accepted at Harvard's Divinity School, though he doesn't believe in God. His true passion is poetry. It is glorious on a worldwide stage to wear a hero's crown that shines with the gems of mighty deeds, with the gold of a fair renown. But every prize this world holds out or has held since the world began, I would renounce and live for a woman's love, the life of a common man. Stephenson's dream seems realized when he meets Cecile Smith, a woman of uncommon beauty. They quickly fall in love and soon become engaged. But the marriage will have to wait. Stephenson is too restless to settle already for the life of a common man. Here's a guy who wants to make good, wants to move on. He's not sure what he wants to do. You know, I can't say that he wants to be an Arctic explorer. What he wants to be is famous. Stephenson transfers from religious studies to the Department of Anthropology. He is approached by two adventurers, Leffingwell and Mickelson, to join an expedition to the Canadian Arctic. He's about to realize his childhood dreams. Dear Cecile, the longer I am away from you, the more in love I get, and the harder it becomes to go away and stay away. Dear old savage, there is no fire, no big chair, no you, no nothing. Your little icicle is all alone. alone I want you to love me, stone. even if it hurts. If we love enough to make us both unhappy now, I'm that so same lonely love that I shall surely go crazy. Come back and we are finally together. With all my love, always yours, Vladimir Stephenson. Rather than sail north with the expedition, Stephenson decides to go it alone, traveling down the Mackenzie River to meet the expedition at Herschel Island. He longs to see the Arctic for the first time through his own eyes. I saw my first Eskimos today. They were not at all as my book learning about the North had led me to believe they would be. I expected them to be short and fat. When I saw them standing among the white men on the river bank, I was surprised to find them all about the same height. I instinctively began to feel the Eskimos were a superior race. On Herschel, this superior race inhabits an inferior world. A frontier community where whalers compete for the sexual favors of the Inuit and missionaries promise to save their souls. This was a community established uh, literally overnight and there was uh, drinking and, and sexual abuse and he observes these scenes in his diaries. Other captains, such as Neweth of the Jeannette, are worse in their dealings with native women. One of the typical stories is that last winter a woman came to missionary Whitaker telling Neweth had enticed her 11-year-old daughter out to the ship. Missionary went out, heard her screams in the cabin, and found her there with her pants off, etc. I guess he felt a bit alienated in this context. He is invited to stay with some of these white people and he clearly at times refuses to take that offer because he feels that by doing so he would become part of that colonial regime, part of a culture whereby abuse and drinking and the rest of it was endemic. And in any case, he was more interested in the pure Inuit stuff. The more he observes the Inuit, the more fascinated he becomes. When he gets news that his expedition ship is trapped in the ice, Stephenson decides to venture out on his own and live among the Inuit. They took me into their homes and treated me hospitably and courteously. They gave me clothes to wear and food to eat. I helped them in their work and joined them in their games until they finally forgot I was not one of them. Stephenson spends the entire winter living with the Inuit of the Mackenzie Delta, discovering them and finding himself. Also an outsider, he develops an unusual bond with these remote people. The knife, fork and plate prejudices have left me and my fingers have been fork and dish for some time now. I finally overcame my aversion to white whale blubber, fairly rotten, and ate a good deal of it the last days. 
Today it is blowing the first blizzard of the year. Equal to an ordinary North Dakota blizzard, but not a star performance. His journals overflow with the detail of a northern world. Thoughts of Cecile and the South begin to slip away. Dear Cecile, you are in comfort and quiet while I am far away in insecure places. It is part of the general scheme according to which men must work and women must weep. The note I received this afternoon was so cold and sort of cranky and formal with not a word to make me feel happy. I suppose this is all foolish. I know you love me. But I am so lonely that I feel like crying. Stevenson has been in the North nearly a year when he hears an extraordinary story. A sea captain, Charlie Klenenberg, returning from the Eastern Arctic, has encountered a mysterious people with blonde hair and blue eyes living on the ice. It's a tale as magical as the Norse sagas. Could they be the descendants of a lost colony of Icelandic settlers? These were people who had hardly, if ever, seen a white man. They were living in, literally in the Stone Age. And Stefansson is determined to find these people because it would make history. And he senses on the spot that this is something I'm going to pursue. It, it may be the stuff of my life. Stephenson rushes south to New York, the capital of explorers, where he knows the story will create a stir and, most importantly, attract money for a special expedition in search of the blonde Eskimo. New York was almost as strange to me as the Arctic had been a year before. I have no time to spare. I must enlist support for my next expedition. He ignores Cecile, his fiance, who's been waiting for him in Boston her friends advise her to end the relationship. This morning I received from Wilma a rather indignant letter in which she asked for an explanation of what I had told you. I never said she advised me to throw you over. Or if I did, I must have been dreaming when I wrote it. I know you are awfully busy, but please write me if you can find a moment to waste on the unworthy. Stephenson hasn't a moment to lose. The competition for funds is intense and he busily writes articles, the outsider ever promoting himself. An old classmate, Dr. Rudolf Anderson, now a respected scientist, reads one of these pieces and offers to join him. Hoping Anderson's scholarship will impress the backers, Stephenson accepts. All explorers of that period had to be salesmen because there are these scientific organizations who are there and you make your pitch. Stephenson gets a foot in the door at the American Museum of Natural History. He must be at his spellbinding best when he meets Henry Fairfield Osborne, Dean of American Science. Osborne was more impressed by my personality than by my ideas about travel in the North. He decided, however, to take a chance and back me. Six months after my arrival in New York, Anderson and I were ready to go. Dear Steph, I too have been thinking over the length of two years. You know that I do not want it to be that long. As to going north, you alone can decide. You know the loss and the gain. Yes, I know the heartache, and I dream as you do, both waking and sleeping. Please write me a goodbye for a few years. So he seems to have decided that if there is going to be a relationship with that woman, it's going to be secondary to his ambitions. And that was a major blow to the relationship. And he's bound for the Arctic, and he wants to return with something that will put his name in history. In the summer of 1908, the Stephenson Anderson expedition arrives in the Arctic. Flush with funding, the 28-year-old anthropologist is eager to discover the blonde Eskimo, a people who apparently have European features. He dreams that perhaps this is the lost colony of Norse settlers he read about in the sagas. 
perhaps he can solve one of the great mysteries of the North. I knew that over 400 years ago, men of Scandinavia had disappeared into the northern mists, hidden forever from the eyes of Europe. There is no reason for insisting that the blonde Eskimo are descended from these people, but there is no reason why they might not be. Before pursuing the blonde Eskimo, Stevenson must first escape the civilized north. The blonde Eskimo live 1,000 kilometers east on Victoria Island. Delay follows frustrating delay as Stephenson deals with the petty details of organizing an expedition. Then his luck changes. A whaling ship offers to take him toward the blonde Eskimo. He quickly accepts and jumps aboard, leaving many of his supplies and his partner Anderson behind. Stephenson is defiantly unconventional a lone wolf explorer, planning to live off the land as the Inuit do. He brings along some dogs, a few men, and most importantly, an Inuit woman who's an expert seamstress. I boarded the ship with Nakuziak and a widowed Eskimo woman, Panagabluk. She was an excellent seamstress, something no party wintering on the Arctic coast can afford to be without. Stephenson and his small party are put ashore 500 kilometers from Victoria Island, still far to the east. They travel by dog sled, looking for a suitable place to set up a winter camp. Stephenson takes great pride in his ability to keep up with the Inuit, to become one with the land. A reasonably healthy body is all the equipment a white man needs for a comfortable winter among the Eskimos. Do not let the worry over tomorrow's breakfast interfere with your appetite at dinner. The friendly Arctic will provide. While the Arctic does provide, it is his seamstress, Panagabluk, who truly sustains and teaches Stephenson. Panagabluk was not just a seamstress. I mean, she would uh, translate for him when his inuktitut was uh, in a rudimentary stage. She would comment upon scenes that they uh, encountered collectively and, and interpret, this is going on. And he spends hours and days and weeks jotting down notes, Pan says this, Pan says that. Um. Today, as usual, writing down a few Eskimo words, getting forms from Panagabluk. Hjordik. 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 Anna Gabluk says when she dreams of a river with a swift current, a strong west wind follows. She says, sometimes I dream well and sometimes badly. She has heard of people who always dream true. When writing up Anna Gabluk's dreams, Stephenson fails to put down one crucial detail. Panagablik is not only sharing her knowledge, but also her bed. Even in the diaries, the intimacy between them is completely hidden and carefully erased. The few slips that you get are sort of accidental. I got to the house at 4.15 a.m. and found Panagablik all well, up, and cooking over a cheerful open fire in the cozy house. Really a rather pleasant homecoming. Stephenson's fiancée, Cecile, languishes in Boston. During Stephenson's lengthy absence, her father dies, and another suitor proposes. When her father dies, the family is without a breadwinner, and at that point, I think, she writes to Stephenson and, and uh, tells him politely the relationship is off. You're right. There's no point in having a relationship with me. My mind will forever be in the Arctic, and I will never be a family man. Keep the ring, if it reminds you of the past. Stephenson's quest for the blonde Eskimo must wait as he struggles to survive in the not-so-friendly Arctic. And there is another worry. Panagabluk is pregnant, carrying their child. The continuing nervous strain of a hand-to-mouth existence has a telling and cumulative effect. 
This is a hard country for a hungry man. March 13th, 1910. Everyone is cheerful here now, but I, who am deeper in the blues than I have ever been in the Arctic, it seems we shall be unable to make use of what is otherwise the best opportunity we are ever likely to have of getting to the copper mine. I suppose we shall have to put off going till next year. But the financial backers refuse to wait another year. Anderson, off collecting specimens, receives a letter that demands the expedition return home. They're not happy with his work. I mean, he's been up there two years, and after a while, they don't want to give him any more money. And he gets wind of this, and he has to prove himself. We are now two years out of New York, and these mysterious people seem as far away as ever. I knew that unless I took definite action, they would remain far away. Stephenson refuses to accept failure. He ignores the order and pushes forward, stumbling across a remarkable object. On May 9th, we had a surprise that made me feel a little like Robinson Crusoe. We came upon a beach. I stopped to examine a piece of wood that had been hacked out with a dull tool. This could only mean one thing, that men who were unknown to the Western Eskimos, whalers and explorers, had been here. Blonde Eskimo are more real than ever now. Elated, Stephenson quickly returns to camp, where he makes another spectacular discovery. Penagablik has given birth to their son, Alex. He is clearly excited. Here he is on the scene with his Inuit wife and uh, a blonde Eskimo of his own, Alex Stephenson. And Stephenson's interest in the Copper Inuit and the Norse origin of these people is bound to be partly motivated by his own life. Stephenson sets out, eager to realize his dream. He pushes forward, back into the Stone Age. I left Panagabluk in charge of our camp and set out across the ice, coming to a large deserted village. From the roof of one of its snow houses, I could see a long way off a scattering of men watching. Our dogs became suddenly alert as we drove toward the distant figure. The strange Eskimos did not move until we were five paces away. When convinced we were men and not spirits, they ran towards us shouting, I am so-and-so, I am well disposed, see, no knife. Who are you? We introduced ourselves while the women went back to their houses to cook for us. We had become very important persons. Encouraged by the friendliness of the blonde Eskimo, Stephenson sends for Panagablik and Alex, eager to share his miraculous discovery with his family. They live among these people, observing their fascinating ways. The next day was to be a holiday, with no hunting or fishing, but with plenty of opportunity for each of us to learn about the other's ways. Wanting to see them shoot with bows, I set up a small stick at 100 yards. They hit within a foot of the target about four out of five times. They immediately planned to make a large dance house. We should see how they dance, and possibly we might dance for them too and a woman sang for us. One song had a rhythm that seemed to resemble that of the ancient Norse poems. I had to imagine nothing. I had merely to look and listen, for here were not the remains of the Stone Age, but the Stone Age itself. In this land from a lost time, Stephenson dreams about his theory that these people are descendants of a long-lost colony of Scandinavians. There are three men here whose beard is almost the color of mine and who look like typical Scandinavians. One woman has the delicate features one sees in some Scandinavian girls. No one could fail to be struck by the European appearance of these people. 
I'm exceedingly glad we fell in with these people. Now he knows that he is on really hot stuff. My ambition was to find these people, and I've done it. And now he feels, I think, that he has to quickly tell the story. Although there seems endless work to do here, I must get home soon to make known my results. Lured by the call of fame, the Arctic dreamer knows he must capitalize on his discovery. He says farewell to his party, leaving Panagabluk and his infant son, Alex, behind. He notes in his diaries that Panagabluk is leaving for good. And then there is a couple of lines which he carefully scribbles over. My sense is that this was an emotional moment, and he is determined not to leave any evidence of his remarkable feeling. Suddenly alone, Panagablik returns to her village, wondering if Stephenson will ever come back. They were gone for two years, and then when they came back to Nunaluk, and that's when my grandmother had my dad on her back. Inuit say she was gone for that long, and she come back with a little baby on her back. Turning away from the past, Stephenson casts his eye on the future. He boards a ship in Alaska, bound for the south. While en route, he tells a Seattle reporter about his discovery of the blonde Eskimo. I took a passenger liner for the States, unaware of what awaited me in Seattle. It was the somewhat questionable beginning of a new phase in my career. Arriving in Seattle, Stevenson discovers he is front page news. Overnight, the Arctic dreamer is an international celebrity. But he will soon realize that fame has its price. In 1912, Stephenson returns to New York after more than four years in the Arctic. His discovery of the blonde Eskimo captivates the public. He's the talk of the town and an international celebrity. This was a fantastic story, and understandably, it made it to the front pages. So overnight, when Stephenson returns, he's a famous man for having located these people, people who haven't seen a white man before, people who are locked up in the Stone Age, and his hypothesis about Norse origin is hot and endlessly debated. Despite the acclaim, Stevenson's peers remain skeptical. Scientists question the headlines, dismissing Stevenson as a publicity seeker and a fake. The murky cloud which surrounded me was not what I would have chosen to carry with me to New York. I reminded myself that converting my notoriety into fame was my immediate job and that I must go to work. He quickly writes a popular book about the expedition and his discovery of the blonde Eskimo. Stephenson dedicates it to Anderson, but fails to fully acknowledge his partner's contribution. Rumors of plagiarism follow. I've looked at that material, and let's just say there's an uncanny parallel between uh, Anderson's uh, journal entries, diary entries, and the early stuff in my life with the Eskimo. While Anderson is overlooked, Panagabluk, the mother of his child, is virtually unmentioned, described merely as an elderly widow and a fine seamstress. To me, it was an insult, what he did to my grandmother. She was always funny of look the four women or the lady that was traveling with us that sold my clothes and went to apparel. He probably would have perished if she didn't help him survive with his hunting and everything. I really don't think he wanted this to get out. He indulged. He did have that marriage in the North, in northern or Arctic fashion, but to him this would hurt image. Stephenson's heroic image attracts interest in his next expedition an Arctic quest to discover unknown lands. The American Museum of Natural History is eager to take advantage of Stephenson's fame. But he casts his sights on a grander goal, the Canadian government. Canada is anxious to assert its sovereignty in the Arctic. 
he goes right to the top, capturing the attention of Prime Minister Robert Borden. 200 years ago, Canada was considered to be nothing better than a trapper's wasteland, a land of ice and snow. It is not beyond possibility that the new lands of the North will be of value someday. Borden is convinced by Stephenson and sets aside over $75,000, an unprecedented amount for Arctic exploration. I set about counting my blessings, that the civilization to which I belonged was interested in discovering new lands, and I knew how to discover these. I can wipe off the face of the earth a million miles of unexplored territory. But before he can begin his quest, Stephenson must comply with Ottawa's requirements. Stephenson can explore new lands, but he must also bring along a contingent of scientists. He knows the scientists respect Dr. Anderson and entices him on board by promising greater recognition and control. Dr. Anderson was responsible for the scientists from the Geological Survey, and they wanted that authority firmed up, and, and Stephenson assured them, yes, indeed, that would be the arrangement once they get up in the Arctic. But he wouldn't put it in writing. Stephenson purchases an old whaling vessel, the Carlock, and he hires Captain Bob Bartlett, Newfoundland's famous ice master. Bob Bartlett was a man in the heroic mold. And personally, I believe in heroism. I believe there are such people, uh, quite remarkable people, who do remarkable things. And Bartlett was quite certainly one of them. Bartlett was remarkable. But even he hesitates when he sees the sorry state of the Carlock. She wasn't built really for ice. She wasn't strong. But he immediately set to work to try to do as much as he could to make the ship more seaworthy, more ice-worthy than she was. The expedition scientists gather on the coast eager to get north before the ice forms. But they are stuck, waiting for Stephenson. And they waited and they waited and waiting for Stephenson. And Stephenson, of course, is making last minute arrangements. He's negotiating with London newspapers the right to the expedition. So this does not go down well. They're basically saying, what is he? Stephenson finally arrives with a newsreel cameraman in tow. George Wilkins is hired to accompany the expedition, document its progress, and highlight Stephenson. Before departing, Stephenson gives one final controversial order. Every member of the expedition should agree neither to publish any written articles nor to give lectures within two years from the return of the expedition, except by my special permission. Dr. Anderson actually tendered his resignation on that occasion, but he got persuaded by Mr. Stephenson to carry on because he was the only one that had any Arctic experience in the Southern Party. On June 17, 1913, the Canadian Arctic expedition finally departs. Off to make history. With the authority and resources of a nation behind us, the most comprehensive polar expedition that ever sailed waves goodbye to civilization, heading northward into the polar sea. To ensure smooth sailing, the expedition splits up. Relieved, Dr. Anderson and many of the scientists journey north on two smaller ships, enjoying their independence. Stephenson, along with most of the supplies and Captain Bartlett, is aboard the Carlock, excitedly returning to his friendly Arctic. I do not remember ever having more distinctly the feeling of homecoming than when I saw the first line of white appear upon the horizon. The ice was friendly and familiar. While Stephenson marvels at the beauty of the ice, Bartlett becomes increasingly concerned. The ice arrives earlier and heavier than usual, testing the Carlock's fragile hull. When Bartlett saw the ice was bad and he realized it was doubtful that they could get to the Mackenzie Delta, he wanted to, to harbor the ship for the winter and go on in the spring, but Stephenson insisted that they must go ahead. 
tension between the two men grows. They clash over how to approach the ice, to skirt the coast in the fashion of the Western Arctic whalers, or take your chances with the open sea. Stephenson was very much of a land person. Bartlett would have felt more comfortable a bit further offshore. And as a matter of fact, she did run aground at least once. When the Carlick runs aground a second time, Bartlett bristles to escape the shallow coastal waters. But Stephenson advises patience. I told him if a local man were in command, he would anchor behind an island. But he thought my ideas of ice were silly. That night, while Stephenson is sleeping, Bartlett notices a rare opening in the ice. He can't resist and noses the ship away from the land. I was awakened by the ship bumping into the ice. I went on deck and found no land in sight anywhere, and ice all around. August 12, 1913. The Carlick is trapped in the ice, perhaps never to escape. Stephenson's Arctic dreams are becoming a nightmare. One month later, winter is approaching, and the Carlick is failing. Captain Bartlett and Stephenson are increasingly estranged. The tension on board is almost unbearable. Anxious to get moving, Stephenson plans a hunting excursion to the mainland. He takes the best dogs and a few men, leaving behind 25 people. Immediately, questions are raised. Is he going hunting or abandoning the ship? He takes off, yes, it's true, and goes on a hunting party. But abandoning the ship, I don't know if that would have been in Stephenson's character. But by this point, you know, people had their perceptions of what he was all about. And this fit right into any type of theory that they had. Stevenson does go hunting, enjoying a few days with his small party. Among them is a young anthropologist from New Zealand, Diamond Jeunesse, who has never seen snow before. An angry storm blows up. It stirs the sea and sets the ice-trapped Carlick adrift, out of sight. Although the Carlick might be in danger of being crushed by the ice, I feel the people aboard her can easily make their way ashore. As for me, I intend to prepare for an expedition of my own. Stephenson seeks out the other two ships of the expedition, safely harbored at Collinson Point, Alaska, turning his back on the Carlick and his men. Bartlett must face the grave situation alone. For four months, the Carlick drifts west, trapped in an ice floe. Finally, on January 11, 1914, her luck runs out. They woke up with all sorts of noises going on, and very soon a crack appeared underneath the water line. She began to fill. And it took quite a few hours after she was already doomed before she sank. The last thing Bartlett did was he put on Chopin's funeral march. And she went down with her flag flying and those funeral march still playing. She just sank quietly. Now a captain without a ship, Bartlett surveys the barren situation. They're stranded 130 kilometers from the closest land, Wrangell Island, off the Siberian coast. They face a mountain of ice and overwhelming odds. He had nobody with him, not one single soul who had any real experience on ice. It would have been a, a, a total disaster if Bartlett hadn't been there. Bartlett decides that his only hope is to lead the party to Wrangell Island, then head off on his own and find a rescue ship. Stephenson 
once again the outsider, is preoccupied with his own quest to discover new lands. Before setting out, he must visit the southern party to demand some supplies and reassert his authority. Hey, I'm back. Yeah, I've had some problems, uh, and here's my solution. And there's no discussion about this. This is the way I see it now. The scientists bristle at Stephenson's meddling and hesitate to obey. Since the Karlik has been lost, Dr. Anderson feels that I am now a leader without anything to lead and that I have no right telling them what to do. Stephenson strides away from the scientists, charging them with mutiny. He takes some supplies and a few men, driven to attack the ice, to discover land, to prove everyone wrong. Dr. Anderson thinks my much-talked-of ice trip shows that I am not quite sane and thinks it will lead to several deaths. The Eskimos also consider the project suicidal. An explorer must not be a pessimist. He must believe that things can be done. As Caesar said of his soldiers, they conquered because they thought they could. While Stephenson sets out to conquer the ice, Captain Bob Bartlett struggles to rescue the Karlik survivors. Almost six months after he left for help, Bartlett commandeers a rescue ship to return to Wrangell Island. Eleven have died. The remaining 12 survivors had resigned themselves to the same fate. When the rescuers arrive, the survivors can barely believe their eyes. Shocked that their ordeal is finally over, eager to leave this desolate, barren rock. Bartlett has stuck with them. Their leader, Stephenson, has disappeared. Without Bartlett, the whole Karlik expedition would have been lost. And th that was an accomplishment in itself. Living on ice floes, Stephenson has also been given up for dead, unheard from for over a year. In fact, Stephenson and his two companions are very much alive, riding the ocean currents in search of unknown lands. Stephenson was a super Eskimo, at least thought of himself as surpassing the Inuit. And the Inuit think that he's crazy to actually go out of sight and, and, and maybe dozens or hundreds of miles uh, just straight north on ice floes. It didn't make sense. Stephenson manages to defy logic and death. But after many grueling months on the ice, his body is exhausted, his mind spent, and Stephenson begins to curse his quest for land. Dark days lead to darker nights. He longs for the bright lights of Broadway, for his lost love. Dear Cecile, Have you remembered me or the past? I would like to think of you as happy most of the time, but with an occasional day of lonesomeness like mine with thoughts of where I am. You did not write me last year. Did you think me dead? Nearly about to give up hope, Stephenson catches a glimpse of something on the horizon. Still prepared to believe that what had appeared on the horizon was a mirage, I climbed a hill. And trying not to appear as excited as the others were, fixed my glasses on the northeastern horizon. There was no mistake in what I saw. It was land. New, uncharted land, stretching blue and white and tawny gray. The discovery of these islands the largest of which he shrewdly names after Prime Minister Borden, transforms the expedition from a colossal failure into a great success, salvaging Stephenson's fragile reputation. Eager to bask in the glory, Stephenson travels south, finally catching a ride on a passing whaler journeying to Herschel Island. 
returning to the colonial outpost. His arrival shocks the whalers and Inuit alike, who had given him up for dead. While they marvel at his exploits, Stephenson confronts a ghost from the past. He unexpectedly meets his country wife, Panagabluk, and their son, Alex, whom Stephenson has not seen for over three years. When the barge came, she met Stephenson and grabbed him by his tie. Hold him up. She's going to kill him. She's going to kill him. Panikabluk makes him accountable, forcing him to uh, acknowledge the kit on the spot in the presence of policemen and whalers, etc. Stephenson quietly acknowledges the relationship and pays for the baptism of Alex and Panikabluk, accepting his role as father and husband. Between ice trips, Stephenson lives again with Panagabluk in the cabin she built. His absence has been difficult on their son, Alex. He had real tough life. My dad had real tough life. He said he was very abused a lot for being a little white kid. If your father is white and you have different mother, people still call you names. Stephenson tries to make it up to Alex. They spend time together and become friends. Stefansson taught him to read and to write, and father and son would speak about New York and the East Coast. And it seems that Stefansson was, in a way, preparing his son for coming out. The Southern Party completes their three-year stint in the Arctic, highlighted by Diamond Janessa's detailed study of the Copper Inuit, challenging Stefansson's sensational theory about Scandinavian origins. But their time is up. World War I is well underway, and the government commands the entire expedition to return home. The Southern Party rushes back, eager to do their patriotic duty. Stephenson, though, remains at large. I don't even know if he cares about the war. Stephenson knows that the orders are out there for him to come back, and he does so record, and witnesses have said, uh, you know, catch me if you can. No real expense will be involved in continuing the expedition, and the danger is no greater than millions are taking now in the war. And the object is the same, personal achievement and the glory of the cause. Possibly we may increase the square mileage of the empire as much as the armies. While thousands die in the trenches of Europe, Stephenson discovers two more small islands. But he falls seriously ill with typhoid fever and must be rushed to Herschel Island. I was put to bed and treated as a very sick man. The days became weeks and I began to worry. Everyone agreed that I was going to die. At Herschel, there was a graveyard where whalers and other white men had been buried with supposed pomp and circumstance. However, I preferred to die elsewhere, and, if possible, later. By eating raw meat in the Inuit fashion, Stephenson slowly recovers and contemplates his future. He asks Panagabluk if he can take their son south. My grandmother was really upset because those white people just came up here to steal us, steal our kids, steal our culture, take everything away. He was the only child of my grandmother's, so she didn't want him to go. After over five years in the Arctic, Stevenson is returning home, alone once again. I left Herschel in a sled. My polar expedition came to its end. November 11, 1918. As jubilant crowds celebrate the end of the bloodiest war in human history, Stephenson arrives in Toronto. He expects to find the world at his feet, keen to hear about his Arctic exploits, eager to attend his scheduled lecture at Massey Hall, 
Another man would have postponed the lecture, but Stephenson confidently proceeds. It turned out to be a somewhat frantic competition between me and one of the great events of the 20th century. I talked against an accompaniment of whistles, bells, and shouting from outside. But the talk seemed to make an impression, though undoubtedly a slighter one than the armistice. Such self-promotion is seen as unscientific and un-Canadian. The scientists of the Southern Party, still bitter about how they were treated during the past expedition, start a quiet campaign to discredit Stephenson, to blacken his name. Many in Canada think me a fake, and there are rumors that I made no long ice journeys and discovered no new lands, that I remained in hiding and bought meat from civilized Eskimos. Seeds have been planted, destined to bear bitter fruit. Stephenson further antagonizes his critics when he writes the account of the expedition. They are annoyed by its contents and incensed by its title, The Friendly Arctic. It must have been really upsetting as a title. If your father or, or husband had been uh, on the Carlock, you would not have felt that their end had been a friendly one, would you? I mean, it was a very yeah. unfriendly end. For the families of those who died during the Carlock tragedy, Stephenson's account is utterly insensitive. Like in war, knowledge gained in the Arctic demands sacrifice. How can anyone condemn the sacrifice of a dozen lives for scientific progress? For the scientists, Stephenson's charge of mutiny in the friendly Arctic is outright slander. Diamond Jeunesse refuses a copy of the book from Stephenson, claiming it's full of inaccuracies. Dr. Anderson and Captain Bob Bartlett are particularly enraged and exchange angry letters. Stephenson is a goddamn liar, a sly, vacillating piece of flesh, smart and oily, as all limelight seekers are. What's a lie and what's an exaggeration? Stephenson had to make a living by publicity, by his writing, by selling books, by selling lectures, and people wanted to hear exaggeration. While criticized in Canada, Stephenson is celebrated in America. He's elected president of the Explorers Club and receives many honors, including National Geographic's Hubbard Gold Medal. Stephenson brushes aside his Canadian critics. I thought it best to pay no attention to the slanderous stories. These attacks did not have any effect upon the willingness of important societies to honor me. As Stephenson receives awards, his son in the Arctic, Alex, waits for his famous father. Finally, he receives a copy of the Friendly Arctic. When he got it, there was big excitement amongst all the Inuvaluit. Oh, we heard you got book from your dad. We heard you got book from your dad. What did he say about you? He said, nothing. There's not a thing in there. Is he going to send for you? Is he going to send for you? No, he never mentioned nothing. All I got is a book. Stephenson had this theory of becoming a native. That was the main point of the friendly Arctic, be one of them. And if he theorized about that, why didn't he go all the way, acknowledging this relationship publicly? But I think uh, his career would have collapsed if he even admitted having uh, a child in the Arctic. His past conveniently hidden away, Stephenson's career as a salesman of the North flourishes. In the 1920s, People are desperate to escape reality and dream about new horizons. Stephenson's romantic vision of the North enthralls. The polar ocean is an Arctic Mediterranean, a hub from which the other oceans and continents of the world radiate like the spokes of a wheel. The land is not desolate or barren. There are thousands of polar bears, tens of thousands of muskogs, and millions of caribou and foxes. It is only the mental attitude of the southerner that makes the north hostile. Stevenson is eager to change attitudes about the north, to showcase his friendly Arctic. He plans to colonize a barren rock off the Siberian coast, Wrangell Island, even though many members of his previous expedition perished there. 
he recruits a group of young followers to be his heroic pioneers. He assured them, don't worry, boys, read the friendly Arctic almost, you know, it's going to be abundant there, you won't have any problems. Uh, read my book. The party of five have a hard time living off the land, as Stephenson did. The abundant wildlife, he promised, is not there. And Stephenson is unable to get a supply ship to the party. Despite the setbacks, Stephenson remains optimistic. The chances of good health are nowhere better than in the Arctic. And you cannot be unhappy when you are exuberantly healthy. They will surely face the next winter cheerfully. Two years later, a supply ship finally reaches Wrangell and discovers the tragic remains of the expedition. Three of the party were swallowed by the ice, trying to reach Siberia, and one was buried on the island killed by scurvy. Only one survivor remains, an Inuit seamstress. He never owns up to what really happened. Stephenson says basically, you know, they didn't know what they were doing and that uh, they should have been able to survive. And yet when his private letters, he says, I think we should keep this from the family. The fact is that the, the friendly Arctic wasn't that friendly. A failure as the salesman of the North, a dangerous dreamer to be avoided, Stevenson is ostracized from Canada. He embarks on a lecture tour across the United States, where his reputation remains untarnished. One town blurs into the next, stretching into a series of one-night stands. He may no longer have the ear of the powerful, but he catches the eye of many women, breaking promises and hearts along the way. The thing I understand least in you, Steph, is your special interest in casual friends and your casual interest in special It is friends. because of you that I have tears in my Why eyes Why don't you tell me you're sorry? Because you're not, I know You it. are not wise. You are just too damned indifferent. Few women could claim to really know him. As in the Arctic, Stephenson was forever moving on, island to island. The detached bachelor is finally shaken when he receives a letter from his ex-fiancée, Cecile Smith. Now married with children, she makes an unsettling confession. I asked for a child, but I thought only of you. Before my closed eyes, I held the vision of your face, your eyes. And so the child was conceived because of my love for you. That you held to your ambition and gave to the world what you have, I am glad. If I had held you, the world might have lost much that you have been able to give. As it is, only I have lost. You have taken nothing from me. You have given me much, though it is but little compared with what I might have received from you. As for me, I love you still. Years ago, Stephenson broke off the engagement, sacrificing love for fame. Now, he has neither. Perhaps his success is in the past. Perhaps his future is bleak. Perhaps the rainbow has receded into oblivion. New York City, Greenwich Village, 1925. A world unto itself, a place where convention is challenged and controversy celebrated. Here, Stephenson is hailed as the great explorer, a celebrity among celebrities. A welcome change from Ottawa, where bureaucrats and backstabbers conspired to ruin his name. Living in the heart of Greenwich Village, I meet all kinds of interesting people. Interesting in ways that differ markedly from the political and scientific figures with whom my Arctic work had brought me into contact. 
One place to meet interesting people is a popular village coffee house run by a gypsy, Romany Marie. There, Stephenson discovers a charming, vivacious woman, almost 35 years younger, Evelyn Baird. I was astonished if this famous explorer walked into the room and we were introduced and we discovered we lived near each other in Grand Village and he gave me a job. Evelyn works on Stephenson's ever-expanding library and his grand project, a government-funded 20-volume Arctic encyclopedia. Over time, the colleagues become more intimate. I remember telling him once that I was thinking of marrying my favorite date. <laughs> he said, well, what about me? And I said, well, everybody knows you're the perennial bachelor. You've never been married. He said, well, start thinking about me that way. In spring 1941, Stevenson, age 62, weds his 28-year-old researcher. Despite the difference of age, the relationship flourishes, and they develop a timeless bond. I made a very attractive apartment for us and tried to teach Steph how to play a little bit. <laughs> he never learned to play. He thought his work was more interesting, but I got him to relax on a Sunday and, and you know, had the best sex I ever had in my life with this, this older man. Stevenson seems to have it all, the love of a good woman and the respect of his peers. He is often consulted for his expertise on Arctic travel and the Inuit diet. With Evelyn by his side, he puts the finishing touches on his Arctic encyclopedia. But Cold War hysteria crashes down on Stephenson's prized project. As Senate investigators await key testimony in the case of Owen Lattimore. In America, the Cold War is in full force, creating a chilling climate of innuendo and accusation. Senator Joseph McCarthy leads the witch hunt. At one of the hearings, friends of Stephenson, the Lattimores, are accused. And during testimony, Stephenson himself is implicated. And I knew him to be a communist. And was... When they asked him about communists, did he know any? He was quick to say he knew and had worked with a lot of Russian scientists. And he volunteered that he thought Jesus Christ was a communist and, and uh, that communists could be pretty good people. The Soviets have done more in the fields of Arctic exploration and pioneering than all the other nations combined. An Arctic encyclopedia can hardly do without them. Stephenson's arguments are ignored. The damage is done. He's tainted with suspicion and the government cancels the Arctic encyclopedia. I think that was the biggest blow he'd ever suffered in his life. This was supposed to be the crowning jewel of his career. And he, um, <laughs> makes me cry to think of it. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> and he never complained. I complained. <laughs> I think of what went into the building of it and how hard it worked. His dream shattered. Stephenson is left to pick up the pieces to try and start over. In 1951, they moved to Dartmouth College, an Ivy League school in small town New Hampshire. They bring with them their library and their hopes for the future. He was a huge presence of a man, big, burly, an icon, if you will. And that's what Stephenson's role really seemed to be on campus, to be Stephenson. Now a living legend, Stephenson retreats to his farm near Dartmouth to write his autobiography, his 27th book. He savors life and the company of friends. He seems at peace, but his unresolved past lingers. Finally, he confides in a female colleague. Stephenson told her that he had a son in the Arctic and that he regretted not having acknowledged the kid. And there is an interesting story that Stephenson wrote with a novelist on, about uh, an Inuit boy, Kak, and a white man, Kapluna, who arrives 
in the Arctic. And the dialogues that the boy and the white man are having are literally as if Stefansson is talking to his son about life among the civilized whites. And the boy obviously wants to join him, but his mother refuses to uh, allow him to go. The boy liked this stranger and burned to accompany him. Later on, later on, the explorer promised. Kak tried not to show the hollow feeling this separation planted in the pit of his stomach. Brace up, old chap. The kabluna patted his shoulder. I'm coming back, you know. Yeah, he always thought he'd come back one of these days. But my dad never, ever saw his father again since he was nine years old. Sad, eh? Stevenson never contacts his son, nor ever meets his six grandchildren. His remaining days are few, and he spends them finishing his autobiography, Discovery. He completes his life story just in time. Steph's last night alive was very moving. We have visitors. A former governor of Greenland came to see us and uh, we talked about falconry and all the subjects that were close to his heart. And then he had a stroke when we were having coffee. And he staggered from the room. The doctor told me it was impossible for him to have walked after what had happened. But he walked out of the room so as not to embarrass, I guess. And that was the end. He was in the coma for 10 days or so after that. Stevenson dies in 1962, survived by his wife, his library, and his unresolved past. A boulder is flown down from the high Arctic to mark the grave of the prophet of the North, to celebrate the explorer who lived like the Inuit. Forgotten, though, is Stevenson's son, Alex, unaware that his father has died until he's contacted by the police. The RCMP told my dad that his dad passed away. And then they were trying to get some money for him, him too, because they thought he might have some money. But Evelyn told him that there was nothing. He said Stephenson made good money, but as soon as he made it, he spent it just as fast. So my dad never got anything. Four years later, Alex suffers a heart attack and dies at age 56, perhaps finally reuniting father and son. His children are left to deal with the legacy of Stephenson, to reconstruct their fragmented past. It's sad. I mean, uh, I've always had a father around, and I have a son, etc. And, and, and these are things that uh, are moving. And, Obviously, at times, they have been uh, angry and, and critical of, of that guy. Some of them more than the others. On the other hand, when they discovered as kids that they were Stephenson and part of that legacy somehow, they were impressed and even thrilled. This was their background. So it was both the pride in being Stephenson and the anger of having been ignored, which sometimes uh, has the upper hand. Every person has his own, has his own story. You're born, you're born. 
You live, you live. You die, you die. Even in death, Stevenson continues to cast a long shadow. Honored by many, discredited by others, Stevenson was Stevenson, an Arctic dreamer who moved relentlessly forward, often too consumed with his lonely quest to truly appreciate what he'd left behind. The more we know about him, the less we understand. Stefansson belongs in the ranks of these great minds who will always remain complex and intriguing. And each new generation will have its new take on Stefansson. There will never be a final story of Stefansson. Tell me, Dr. Stefansson, have you any regrets? Well, I hope I would be a little wiser. <laughs> uh, I'd hope I'd make fewer mistakes. Uh, of course, uh, I grieve for the loss of these men, of but that's how it is in war. That's how it is in many other occupations. <laughs>